So good morning. And this morning I have a special guest that I'm very honored to introduce you to, and that's Dr. Clinton Rubin. Dr. Rubin is a distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the State University of New York. When he's not teaching, he's busy researching cellular mechanisms that are responsible for maintaining bones health, how mechanical stimulus can help bone grow, and help, how to help it heal faster after a fracture. His research has been put to very good use, developing devices that give us non-drug treatment strategies. One of the devices he's founded is the Maradigm LIV. LIV stands for Low Intensity Vibration. I'm gonna just refer to it as LIV. So LIV is a non-drug treatment strategy that builds bone. It's been shown to successfully and safely build bone in persons diagnosed with osteopenia, osteoporosis, and low bone density caused by other diseases or comorbidities. Dr. Rubin has published over 300 articles, has been cited roughly 33,000 times, give or take a few. And unfortunately, at times, some of those citations are used by companies that make unsafe whole body vibration machines. If you don't mind, we're gonna dive right in. Could you please tell the listeners what the difference is between whole body vibration and LIV? Great, thanks Margaret, and thanks for everyone for, for listening in. So if we're jumping right in, let's, let's deal with high versus low magnitude vibration. So if we start with some sort of benchmark, um, let's take Earth's gravitational field. So that's called G. One G is what glues you to the ground. Low intensity vibration in, in the context of this discussion are mechanical signals that are below the acceleration of one G. So if you're accelerating up and down, let's say in an elevator or on a vibrating plate, it means you don't actually leave uh, the surface because the acceleration isn't sufficient to lift you off the ground greater than 1G is high magnitude vibration. And uh, there are several devices out there, uh, both in the low and the high magnitude vibration state, uh, where uh, companies might argue that it's beneficial to bone or bone and muscle or athletic performance, et cetera. But as a bioengineer and a, a scientist uh, that's very interested in translating my research into the clinic, my premise is, first, we have to do no harm. We want to ultimately see some benefit, but we certainly don't want bad outcomes. And one of the great risks of high magnitude vibration, those signals over 1G, is that you can actually cause harm, and in some cases, quite significant harm. So you think of devices out there that are um, you might find in high-end gyms, et cetera, where you stand on the device and the instructions are to bend your knees, there's a reason to bend those knees. And that is that the, it's called the transmission of the mechanical signal, the transmissibility of the vibrating platform up into the regions of interest in the case of osteoporosis, hip and spine, is that those signals also continue up into your axial skeleton and into your head so that if you actually have these jarring vibrations that actually can move right through your axial and appendicular skeleton into your, into your head, you could conceivably actually even cause um, damage to your brain. There are reports of people standing on vibrating uh, devices, high uh, magnitude vibrating devices uh, that cause detached corneas. There are people that complain of low back pain um, they're there, but, but don't believe me, believe the, what's called the ISO or the International Standards Organization, which actually has advisories for human exposure to vibration. It's called ISO 2631. You can Google it and read all about it, but essentially they come up with, for, with advisories for people in the workplace, people who might be on the uh, the floor of a big uh, uh, manufacturing site or truck drivers or helicopter pilots, how much vibration is safe for you and me, healthy adults, to be exposed to? 
And what you'll find is there is this interplay between frequency, cycles per second, intensity or magnitude, don't forget G, and duration. How long every day can you be exposed to high magnitude vibration? And these devices, going back to these high-end gyms um, that you stand on, at the low settings, the G force is around 8 G. That's eight times Earth's gravitational field. At the high settings, they're around 15 G. The ISO 2631 advisories would say that these devices are safe for less than 16 seconds of exposure per day. So the, think of it as uh, when you go to your hardware store and uh, grab a bucket of paint, you add a, a dab of color to it, and you want to shake up the paint to mix it. It's essentially the same thing. You are standing on a paint shaker. The consequences of this although I am aware of very, very little evidence that it's beneficial to bone, there's published literature in the bone world that says, particularly if you're osteopenic or osteoporotic, having low bone density at the femoral neck or in the spine, that you're actually increasing your risk, increasing your susceptibility to fracture by putting in these high magnitude uh, uh, signals. I mean, Think of it as standing on your desk and jumping off your desk 30 times a second. I mean, it's painful even to think about and you have poor bone quality and you're putting your bone at risk. So back to low intensity, our signals and things that we do in our lab and in our clinical trials, first doing no harm, we never go above uh, 1G. All our studies are G or, or seven tenths of gravitational field or lower. And in the clinic, that's usually around 0.4 G or half of Earth's gravitational field. In the context of us moving around, when you walk down the street, you have a heel strike. Your heel hits the sidewalk. The gravitational impact of that is around 1.2 G. When you're running or sprinting, it's probably around 2 G. So think of that 2G to 8G, pretty scary, but 2G to 0.4G, pretty safe. So going back to the same criteria of ISO 2631, our devices, whether it's to mice or cells or to humans, is considered safe for between four to eight hours of exposure per day. But um, none of our trials last eight hours per day because nobody has the patience to do that. But the difference really is if your listeners pick up anything from our conversation, it's that these high magnitude devices, unless you're an elite Olympic athlete and you think for some reason that having a 0.5% increase in jumping power uh, might get you closer from a silver to a gold medal, it just is not worth the risk. So, um, I know people hate me for saying it, but I would avoid these devices like I would avoid COVID. So one has to wonder how they even manage to sell them and put the literature on them that they do. Um, well, that's a, that's a good question. I wonder about it myself. I think that uh, one of the reasons is that, remember, there's this ISO 2631, an international criteria for a human exposure to vibration. When I ask my colleagues in, on the industry side that actually sell these devices, mm -hmm. they point out that these are advisories for people in the workplace. When you go into a gym or you put one of these things in your home, that's by your decision and it's not an occupational risk. Oh my gosh. Decision that, that you make. So I think, uh, you know, I don't want to get all uh, weepy-eyed about this, but I think there are issues of integrity involved. Mm -hmm. I think that most of the biomedical scientists who are examining high-magnitude vibration devices don't really understand the risks, and they believe the industry folks who are saying, sure, try this, we've never had a complaint. I think that uh, our health 
of our musculoskeletal system deserves a little clearer focus on these issues. It's just like if your physician prescribed for you an anti-resorptive like Fosamax, bisphosphonate, um, and that physician said, take this pill once per day and you'll stop osteoclasts, bone eating cells from being active. You say, hey, that's great. I think I'll take 40 pills a day because it'll work that much better. You're putting yourself at risk. So um, I believe that there have been, once a company makes a claim that it stops osteoporosis or builds bone, not only do they have to demonstrate efficacy, they'd have to prov provide that scientific information that it's true, they also have to demonstrate that it's safe. And um, I fear that there are many companies out there that are willing to make these wild claims about curing baldness or curing osteoporosis or something crazy like that. And they just tend to take a blind eye to the risks that it puts us at. So bottom line, um, you know, unless you want to jump off your desk 30 times a, a second, uh, you're, I would avoid it because you're putting many, many systems at risk. So most of my audience is, you know, listening because they're concerned about their bone health, but having been a physio for so long and having children who love going to the gym, you know, and a lot of these gyms have, you know, high intensity platforms out there. You know, I mean, I'm concerned when I, you know, overall, when somebody's doing something that to make them their health better and it's putting them at danger and not just, you know, in terms of bone health, but in terms of, you know, organs and discs and, so if you can say a couple of words on that. Sure. I, so, so I think that the goal of our work is to provide a surrogate for exercise, for, for you know, to provide mechanical signals that are so important to many, many physiologic systems, to the health, vitality of organs, cells, etc., tissues. Um, but let me emphasize that we are just that, we're a surrogate. There's no real replacement for, for mother nature. So exercise is great. So, so, so the best thing you can do with one of these machines is to actually go into the gym, pick it up and move it from point A to point B. These are very heavy machines and I think that would create great exercise so long as you lift with your knees and not your back. But you're absolutely right that um, these high magnitude signals are actually dangerous to a number of tissues, your disc tissue. Um, you know, look at, again, going back to ISO 2631, truck drivers, long haul truck drivers, helicopter pilots are just incessantly complaining about low back pain. And that's from the vibration. It's not from sitting, it's from vibration. So these are really, think of vibration as potentially good a surrogate for exercise, which is how I look at it, but it's also a really nasty pathogen, right? That's why there are these advisors out there. So there is a window which you must stay within. And if you go too much, you're putting lots of systems at risk. Or if you go too little, things are going to waste away. So certainly go out and exercise as best you can, but there are problems, there's diseases, there's age, et cetera, that we're faced with that make the mechano response of your bone and muscle uh, begin to fail. Okay, well, that certainly um, gives us a good picture as to the difference of a whole body vibration. And, you know, I mean, I've stood on both. So if I could just share with listeners the difference of how it feels, because I had a client who actually gave me her power plate yeah. <laughs> and, and as you say, the biggest workout we had was dragging it into the house. Um, and I thought, oh, well, you know, if one of us doesn't use it, our son, who was a rugby player at the time, you know, he'll be into it. And I, I literally, we had more time with it, intimately with it, in transporting it than ever standing on it because it was so wild to be on it, you know. And, and then when I look at the PowerPlate studies, they were good because they did exercises on the power plate. 
and they compared them to crappy exercises as opposed to comparing it to an exercise exactly the same off the power plate. Whereas I had an opportunity to stand on one of your other devices a de decade ago when I was at a conference. It was a Jubit platform, super like calm. It was, it was like the size of a, a bathroom scale, easy to carry, easy to lift, um, you know, and just really pleasant to be on and just nice a little feeling and vibration. So it was just like night and day. And yet, I don't, I don't know if I was in your shoes, I would be very upset that everybody was taking all that great work that you have done, you know, and, and then go, oh, well, we're citing, you know, Dr. Rubin on this and this and this. And yet they have, it, they're not the same at all. No, no, they're, they're huh? absolutely very, very different. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it's, um, you know, it's, it's the idea that people stand on these high magnitude devices thinking that it's good for them. They just need to change that perspective. And, and you're right, it is very frustrating. But it's the marketing that's out there for people. It's so hard for them to know the difference because these companies are so aggressive. And, and some yeah. of them are built into things that are marketed specifically for people with osteoporosis. I think of OsteoStrong, they're so aggressive around in the US. We don't have them, thank God, here yet. But they actually have, as part of their compression program, they have that you get to stand on a vibration platform. And I looked on the photo and they're literally having to hang on, you know, because it's so high. And I know I have fragile individuals that are told this is good for them and this is safe for oh. them. And it's just like, I mean, if it's bothering me, you're the one doing the research that they're taking, you know, the advantage of it would, I don't know, you can't sue them or something. <laughs> uh. I, I, I guess I, busy. I would. I mean, it, imagine my uh, surprise to walk into a Costco and see a big, huge vibrating plate with signs saying, this will cure osteoporosis. This will, you know, make you strong, et cetera. And you sit there and you speak to the poor salesman who's just doing what he or she has been, you know, told to do, go out and sell devices. And it is... It's snake oil. Um, you are right in pointing out that, that many of these, um, uh, this work that tries to justify high magnitude devices, um, they're very poorly designed. Um, and they're, I think, very selective at, about the data that they Absolutely. put out there. And, and they're um, all done with healthy young adults. They're done with healthy young adults. And again, I will, I'll point out to a range of published literature, which, again, I feel somewhat responsible for this because, as you point out, many of the power plates and high magnitude devices point to me as justification the vibration works. So if a little vibration works, a lot must be better. That's why we bring 40 apples a day to our teachers so that she <laughs> likes us that much more. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel horrible because people that have low bone density, particularly those who are not that interested in taking long-term drug uh, treatments to prevent a disease, and I understand that. I, I wouldn't want to do it either. But they are being cajoled or guilted into standing on these devices and they are dangerous. If you have low bone density in your spine or hip, and you stand on one of these devices, and you're right, it is terrifying to stand on them, um, you're at risk of, of, of fracture right then and there, and a number of other systems. But this is all too depressing even to think about, because again, um, I feel sometimes responsible for it. And I use programs such as yours or uh, things on my website, et cetera, not to say, hey, you know, buy my device. It's much rather to be very, very cautious about standing on high magnitude vibration devices. Yeah. It will hurt you. All right. Well, that certainly wraps up the comparison of a low intensity vibration platform to a high Whole, or what they call a whole body vibration platform. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.